This is Bonjour Hi, the Don't Heart Huckabees edition. I'm Avi Feingold, and I'm here with Phoebe Maltzbovi. We are your Frozen Chosen. On today's show, Trump has started to make political appointments. We discuss the impact they may have and what he is signaling with them. Before that, though, we talk about the violence that erupted in Amsterdam in the wake of an important soccer match. I don't want to call it a pogrom because I don't think it was that. But as soon as I say that, we know that we're talking about what happened in Amsterdam uh, last week. Uh, many Israelis that went to uh, Amsterdam for the match between Maccabi Tel Aviv and Ajax. Uh, it's spelled Ajax as in Ajax, Ontario, but or the cleanser. But it is Ajax and they uh, were having a match. It's unclear as to the timeline, at least to me, because it seems very complicated. But they're was definitely provocation on behalf of the Israelis that went to visit the city and were tearing down signs. They were uh, tearing down Palestinian flags. They were shouting death to Arabs. There was a lot of actual provocation going on. And in retaliation for that, uh, and this obviously there's a long history of soccer hooliganism, uh, people were uh, going after anybody who was visibly Jewish or Israeli or even seemed to be aiding and abetting Israelis. And the resulting video is very disturbing. There's a lot of videos of people getting beaten up in very brutal manners. And Israel went and sent planes to rescue, to, to get the Israelis out of there. This is almost, I felt like an Entebbe raid. What am I, am I missing anything that you know of? Basically, it seems like a couple things happened and how related they are is maybe the hard part to piece together. One is indeed soccer hooliganism from Israelis. And I guess, as I understand it, soccer hooliganism tends to involve a bunch of, it, let, let me put it like this. There's sort of like on the sensitivity spectrum, there's liberal arts college, everybody's stating their pronouns and offering a trigger warning. And then there's on the other end of the spectrum, soccer hooligans. As in there's a kind of like, a certain amount of equal opportunity racism sure. and offensiveness that goes on in soccer hooliganism. She says, knowing nothing about soccer hooliganism. I, I, I did not know this, by the way, f from the from the Wikipedia page, Ajax was known as the Jewish team for a very long time. Right. I, so this is something very confusing for to me about the what it means when something is known as the Jewish team, because it seems like that means that people do anti-Jewish taunts at the team seems like it has nothing to do with any actual Jews being on the team or yeah, anything like that. Yeah, same thing with like Tottenham in right. England, I believe. Was yeah, I, I, something I've read about over the years, I've never understood it. I am too American. I don't know what this is about. So basically, Israelis did some, sounds like, racist soccer hooliganism in Amsterdam, and that involved destruction of property and saying of nasty things. Mm -hmm. Also, a apparently premeditated response that was perhaps less to do with soccer and more to do with an existing protest movement in Amsterdam protesting Yes, and against that there was Israel. a convergence of this in yes. some and that you know, this led serendipitous to some manner. physical violence against people. Yeah. Okay. Who either were or were suspected of being Jews. And that this has, I guess, repeated itself in Amsterdam since. And the relation of these two things, it, it, it has, and then that this has been kind of misreported to some extent as a squabble among soccer hooligans when it seems like there was on the one hand soccer hooliganism and on the other hand beating up of Jews or presumed Jews in the streets of Amsterdam. Now, this has also been interpreted, and I think this is why we're talking about this on Bolzer High and not just being like, okay, let the soccer experts figure this out, although the mensch warmers. They did do an excellent credit job to them. of this. Yes, yes credit to them. Uh, but the reason we're also taking it on here is because what I saw immediately after this were a bunch of references to Anne Frank, to the history of Jews in the Netherlands, and specifically during the Holocaust, and not just about the Netherlands, but also about Europe. You know what I mean? Like the sort of North American looking over at Europe, associating the European Jewish present very much with the European Jewish past. And I don't know how to put this because it, it's not a full misunderstanding, but it's like the reasons for anti-Jewish violence today and the reasons for anti-Jewish violence at 
earlier times in European history are different. It doesn't mean it's better now. It doesn't mean it's a good now. It, it's different, different situation. If you're trying to understand it, understand, not excuse, but understand. Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, and to draw direct correlations from one to the other and to say, because this, then that is not allowed, or because this, then that makes it worse, is also complicated as a result of that. So I guess... Like Anne Frank was not like pro-Palestinian, or, you know, Zionist, so to speak, and therefore to drag her into it is not really like fair. I mean, I think because I kept seeing that. Over yeah. The past so week. what's related, what I think is related, because somebody posted something about like Europeans not getting that it's more than a coincidence that they hate the same people that their ancestors did, something along these lines. I think there is a certain amount of continuity in assumption that Jews are up to something nefarious that, you know, goes way, way back in the past in Europe, um, and not just in Europe, up to the present. However, I don't think that you can conflate that with people who are of Arab, Muslim, perhaps Palestinian background themselves, and are angry about what's happening in Gaza. Because I think the question, though, is, whether like how does this impact how one discusses it because it's still not okay in my view to go beating up jews in amsterdam whatever it is israel's up to there that's still not okay to be beating up jews in amsterdam but the problem is to talk about it as if it's kind of this seamless sort of smooth continuity from old european anti-semitism when there's clearly other stuff going on is confusing and it sometimes feel like it's opens up the argument of, but look at all these awful things Israel's doing. This is different from what was happening in World War II when there wasn't Israel. And yeah, anyway. But I yeah. think like I where I come down on this is it is not OK to be beating up Jews in the streets of Amsterdam, even if some Jews are being, you know, assholes. It doesn't you know, it doesn't make that OK. And it wouldn't be OK to be beating up Arabs and Muslims in the streets of Amsterdam. That does not appear to be what happened here. Yeah. So. Let me ask you this. If we knew that it was just, you know, soccer hooliganism and a retaliatory soccer hooliganism, would you then go and say that this is anti-Semitism? If all it was was soccer hooliganism, I would have to say, I'm sorry, Israelis, but you're wrong, right? This is clearly not what happened. There was clearly a protest movement that was already in the air. I don't know what their motives were, and I don't know how it got out of hand. And I think that getting it out of hand was absolutely horrible. But I'm just not ready to completely absolve the Israeli soccer fans have any responsibility for anything that's going on. Do, do you understand what I'm yeah, saying? That like I am. I, I, I think I am okay. because I, I'm, I'm not resolve. I'm not absolving them from the responsibility for being the soccer hooligans for being racist assholes. I'm absolving. I think physical violence, and I think this has been pointed out in a bunch of the columns I've read about this. So this is not my original thought, but if every time people were nasty about Jews at a protest or destroyed an Israeli flag or something, Jews retaliated with physical violence. Would that be like, well, you know, I guess, you know, they, that, they were mean to the flag. They said something mean about Jews. They said, go back to Poland. I guess it's fine then. I, I, I guess, guess it's fine to go to the Arab and Muslim neighborhood and beat people it's up. It's like, what no. I've I mean, said I'd, before, that we have yeah. to hold ourselves to a higher standard. I disagree with that. Say, so that's where I just fundamentally, yeah, I ethically, know. whatever you want to call it, disagree with that. I think we have to hold all people... No, I'm standard. saying that we shouldn't be shouting out negative things. To I don't. To I'm like, not endorsing it. I'm saying, but yeah. I don't think that it in any way excuses what what happened. No, I, I think if you it's, know it's, that what you're doing is bad people. and set and it's bad. Period. Also, it, but it doesn't seem like it was a provocation. That's the thing. Like from what I've read about this, it Do does you think not nobody seem like, was provoked by this. I'm sure people were provoked by this, but it seems like the scale of response suggests this was not that. But what I would say more broadly, though, and this is something that's come up on this program before, is that like I'm always hesitant to refer to specifically Palestinian anger at Israel as anti-Semitism, because I feel like it's just something too specific and too materially. I agree with you on that one as well. Like, I, I think it's just like it's it is, about... you know, it's not, it's not the same thing. What, however, however, I am more than comfortable referring to people who have no skin in the game and are just like random, generally white, but not always uh, yes. 
Westerners going all in for Palestine because of those meanie Jews. If, if um, Greta Thunberg that, was actually yes. the one beating people up in Amsterdam. <laughs> I, I would feel entirely comfortable saying that anti-Semitism enters into, I don't think it fully explains, it enters into the popularity of the Palestinian cause in the West. I think that's absolutely, I have no qualm saying it enters into it. I certainly don't think it's all of it. Obviously there's, you know, understandable, like what is Israel doing here? You know, reactions as well that many Jews have. And um, that I don't think that's anti-Semitism. But what I'm saying is I don't think that it makes sense. And I do think one does see this and I, don't agree with it. Like the idea that Palestinians are basically anti-Semitic for existing. And that doesn't make any sense. You know what I mean? That that does that doesn't help anything. And it's not gonna bring peace. It's not gonna help. It's not gonna solve anything. I'm still so very much on it. the fence about David Badil, but I do want to quote him. He mentioned on Twitter that people feeling that the need to insist that throwing into canals, attempted stabbings, head stompings, and hunting down Jews this week in Amsterdam is provoked by the bad behavior of Maccabi Tel Aviv fans. Well, good to know that in this instance, everyone is okay with disproportionate retaliatory violence. <laughs> Let's move on. I feel like even though, again, we are a Canadian show, we get impacted by our neighbors to the south. There have been many announcements this week of cabinet positions and high level positions uh, of the new Trump administration. Um, Marco Rubio as Secretary of State, Matt Gates as Attorney General. Pete Hegseth as defense secretary, who's a, if you don't know me, he's a Fox News host. Lee Zeldin, EPA administrator. Elise Stefanik as ambassador to the UN. Stephen Miller, obviously deputy chief of staff. We need to call him out. And, Do uh, we? We're, we're going to call I him feel out? Like, I, I, don't know. I feel like that's insufficient. <laughs> Do better. That's it. Do better. <laughs> um, and then the 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 two that I love, Elon Musk and Vivek Ramaswamy in charge of government efficiency. Wait, did you mention Huckabee here? I did not. Uh, he's not in the okay. New York Times list of like major names to be listed. Do you, let me ask you something, Phoebe. Do you heart Huckabee? My Huckabee has long been my least favorite American politician. Like, I mean, because so this is one of these things where like, this is a view I know I've held for like years and years and years and not really had reason to think much about in recent years. So I was trying to remember what it was. And then it, it all came back to me. Um, he's the sort of America is a Christian country type guy. Mm -hmm. America has a very specific separation of church and state that's different from Canada's. There are always these kind of internal political, cultural fights about things like prayer in schools or just sort of the Christian right, like, you know, how how Christian should America be? And he's very much like America's a, a Christian country type guy. That's his deal. And yeah. that's not something I particularly want for America. And I think he is an interesting pick as ambassador to Israel. What this highlights is that Republicans especially love Israel for reasons that are not always beneficial to the Jewish community. And yet the Jewish community has this strange bedfellow relationship with the evangelical world. The Christian right has embraced Israel partially because of weird end times religious reasons, right? That's the easiest, simplest way to put it, that they do believe Jesus is going to come once all the Jews are in Israel, but that's when the Jews are all going to die. And you know, Jesus is going to come back and lead all of the Americans into the promised land and to be the future of everything. There's that piece of it on the Christian right. The other piece that I think maybe it's the, the same or maybe it isn't, that um, it's not so much that the evangelical right loves Jews as much as they really dislike Arabs and Muslims. And therefore, if you're picking sides, then clearly we're picking the Judeo-Christian side as opposed to the um, Muslim side of argument here. And we are going to back, you know, that side. of. I will. Yes. And please, because I think that is all it. But there's another piece here that I think we have to discuss. Remember Trump sort of threatening Jews, like, if you don't vote for me. Yes, yes, of course. I think this is his answer, because I don't think Jews are harding Huckabee. And this is a kind of, to me, this really did feel like a middle finger to Jews. Somebody whose values are so far from that of most American Jews, because most American Jews, like 70 something percent voted for Harris and not Trump. 
to me, this seems like a, a real case of like, I'm not pro-Israel for Jews, like for Trump on Trump's behalf, that he's saying he's not being pro-Israel for Jews. This is a different, and also uh, here's where I want to, like, we're, we're unpacking a lot of terms here. So it's a little, a little wordy today, much like anti-Semitism, we're unpacking, we're going to unpack pro-Israel because pro-Israel means different things to Jews and to somebody like Mike Huckabee. It obviously means different things to different Jews as well, but generally for Jews, it has something to do with Israel, the actual existing place, which many Jews have been to, many Jews have family in, many Jews care about in a familial way, even if they don't have actual relatives there, right? For non-Jews, it's an idea, and it represents all the stuff about the, there's the evangelical angle, there's also, and this is what I wrote about for the CJN magazine not long ago, uh, philosemitism as this kind of, the, this new pro-Israel philosemitism as basically like anti-woke politics, right-wing politics. And these things are just getting more and more separated. And it, it becomes clear when you look at how few Jews actually voted for Trump, just how completely decoupled these things are. And to me, the choice of Huckabee really seems like a kind of like, I'm, I'm not catering to Jews here. I'm catering to something else that is tangentially about Jews. No, so I disagree because okay. I think that the Jews that voted for Trump actually do heart Huckabee. Right. They love Huck, like they love that brand of evangelical because they they align themselves with this. They, to, yes, they, and they go oh, so, so far. So he's, so he's really just catering his... to his people. And that's Trump's yes. actual always mode of like doing things is I don't care what other people do. And that's bad. Would leadership. You say they, OK, let me obviously let me ask, since you know this world better than I do. Would you say that they heart Huckabee? Or like, would they have rather somebody who's very right wing pro Israel and Jewish than Huckabee? I think, yes, I think that it, it raises the profile. It shows that you care about us as a people and you're going to bring somebody in from, you know, within whatever the subgroup it is. So, so yeah, and I think that this is Trump being Trump and saying, I'm going to cater to my people. I'm going to find you the non-Jew that you really do like if you like me. And it's going to help, like raise the profile of evangelical Christianity in Israel. It's, it, it's, serves a dual purpose. And I think that that serves Trump's interests very well, but it doesn't serve the interests of all of Jewry or definitely all of American Jewry. He's not, he doesn't care mm -hmm. about that. Huckabee does not represent popular position of Jewish Americans vis-a-vis -vis Israel. He represents the popular position of Trump supporters vis-a-vis -vis Israel. And that is why you know, he is there. It doesn't mean that it's going to be a good thing, but we'll have to wait and see. I'm not waiting and seeing. I think it's I'm, a bad thing. I'm going <laughs> to just... Meaning, like, like I mean, I'm curious how it's going to shake okay. down. Like, what are yeah. the pieces I mean, that are going to happen? I mean, I will say happen? that I think there isn't much choice but waiting and seeing in terms of, like, what happens with Trump generally. And please surprise me, Donald Trump, by brokering an instant peace in the Middle East. By all means, prove me wrong. I'd be very happy if that happens. From the preliminary things I've read about this, doesn't seem that way. So Canada, Canada, what are the implications for Canada here? American Jews did not come out for Trump. Depending where you live, depending who you know, it might feel like they did, but they didn't. And those who did, it wasn't necessarily because of Israel. There were a lot of other factors at play that, um, from what I've seen of polling, were more in important even to Jewish voters. But... What's the deal with Canada? Are are Canadian Jews going to go off uh, Trudeau? Well, I think the to take a step back first, I think conservative Christians are going to have more strength, you know, and a voice within Canadian politics going forward if this is, you know, the next four years or beyond. American Christians have long lobbied government successfully for positions that they have wanted. It hasn't always been as powerful in Canada. And I think this is signaling in that direction. So that's my first thing for Canada. Do I think the Canadian Jews? I think Canadian Jews are all already, you know, there in terms of the conservative movement. And I think we talked to Josh Liebline about this. Uh, we'll have to wait and see when the election actually happens. But I don't have a lot of hope for Canadian Jews and liberal politics anymore. But that's because partially it's because the liberals are moribund to begin with. I think it's also just like, I mean, there's just not the same risk there. there are, like, if you look at the reasons why 
American Jews wouldn't vote Republican. These do not all track like that doesn't all map onto Canadian politics. That's like, good, like I said, because yeah, social yeah, conservatism yeah, isn't yeah. a big deal. But it's not even just about social conservatism. It's about specifically Christian social conservatism. Well, in so North America, manifest- let's be honest, that's a big part that the, the two are so uh, overlapping. I'm going to push back because I think in Canada, I think there's a more more of this kind of broad, like anti-woke or whatever movement that's like where people are very worked up about gender stuff and that isn't so specific to Christianity and that is therefore more inclusive of socially conservative immigrant populations, you know, if it's a little, yeah, except a little in, different. Yeah. I think that in America, those things all become one and the same. If you go to an American megachurch of the like generalized evangelical variety, um, guns are part of religion and anti-migrant, you know, sentiment is part of the like religious sentiment and discussion, uh, prosperity, wealth, you know, and we should all be out there getting the most that we can. That's part of the religious sentiment. Maybe that's not the case as much in Canada. Going back to the Jewish community, I think that we are going to be in for a big surprise at some point fairly soon when the evangelical world at some point turns on us. And it's not a great relationship to be in is to go and say, well, they're Zionists. They're the staunchest Zionists around. They love supporting Israel um, because it's purely transactional in that in their situation. It's not even philo-Semitism. It's, it's something way more nefarious than that. In Berlin, rumors are spreading. Holocaust victims, their bodies are just dug up. It's a shunda. But the truth is even more unnerving. Was your family in the Shoah? Dude looks like he was in the Shoah. As the world panics. This is some ritual, bringing the dead back to life. No, you said this wasn't illegal. It isn't, I don't think. One woman seeks the truth. These are questions you can't answer. And you're too afraid to even ask them. Justice, a Holocaust zombie story. An original audio drama from the CJN in association with the Ashkenaz Foundation. Listen now at the cjn.ca slash zombies or wherever you get your podcasts. Let's move on to Nachas. Phoebe, uh, do you have a Nachas? Do you have a Bregas for us this week? What do you, what do you got? I have a Nachas, which is that mm. I'm excited to see that one of our sister podcasts or, or brother podcasts or however we are calling it, our sibling podcasts, another ca- Canadian Jewish news podcast, Culturally Jewish, has an interview with a musician named Joseph Landau, who I had noticed performing at the Roncesvalles Farmer's Market. and. He is a klezmer musician. I have not yet heard the Culturally Jewish podcast on this because I just learned of it, but I am super, super excited to listen to that um, once we're done recording because I feel like we we portrayed Roncesvalles as being sort of not a delightful place to be Jewish, but there are, you know, you can hear klezmer music and buy challah at the farmer's market. It's not all bad. It's it's ironic how, <laughs> despite the fact that you are Jewish, you are the ambassador from Roncesvalles to the Jewish community <laughs> or to the rest of the world. You are doing more for Roncesvalles' um, PR. And anti-PR maybe, but what are you going to do? So Avi, what have you got this week? Uh, I have an achas as well. I have an achas about Israeli soccer fans in Europe. And it is not about Amsterdam. It's Bros, the Israeli TV show that is on Netflix about two best is friends that are Israeli that have a bar in Jerusalem. In Hebrew, the show is called Ba'eshu Ba'mayim, which is uh, the tagline for Betar Yerushalayim, which is the team that they are also big fans of. It is very funny, um, but it does involve them going to Europe, going to Krakow specifically, and having a trip uh, involving a lot of some soccer hooliganism and not, and the Holocaust and everything all together. It is a highly entertaining watch. I binged it in like one sitting. Uh, It is in Hebrew with uh, English subtitles or whatever subtitles you want, I'm sure. Um, But go check that one out if you want a better dose of Israeli soccer in Europe or in Israel as well. Um, So check that out. 
thank you for listening to Bonjour Chai for the week ending November 16th, Shabbat Parashat Vayera. The show is produced by Michael Freeman, edited by Zach Kaufman. The executive producer for CJN Podcasts is Michael Freeman. Our music is by SoCalled. We are a project of the Jewish Living Lab and are distributed by the CJN Podcast Network. You can listen to all our past episodes on our page at the cjn.ca slash bonjour, and you can subscribe to the podcast and automatically receive all episodes on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. We'd love it if you told a friend about Bonjour Chai. It is one of the best ways we get new listeners. And as always, you can email us with comments at bonjour at the cjn.ca. 